Vaiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaiguru Ji Ki Fateh. Welcome to The Politics Show. Today, we are joined by Scottish National Party MP, Martin Doherty Hughes, the MP of Scottish Sikh Jagdar Singh Johal, who's been detained in India for more than 12 months now, following allegations that he was involved in a murder. Martin, firstly, thank you for joining us on the oh, Sikh channel today. Pleasure and welcome to uh, the fullest office from the floor of the House of Commons. It takes a bit of a climb to get here, but more than delighted to see you. As you know, concerns from Sikhs across the globe continue to intensify on this matter, particularly following claims that Jukhtar has been physically and mentally tortured. How alarmed are you at the current situation? And are there any updates that you have for us? I mean, the concern that we have, or I have had as Jack Tars MP and both his own local community in Western Barnshire around the initial accusations of torture are that we have been unable to gain access to independent manic examination. And that continues, and, and Jack Tar has continued to ask that that be investigated. The UK government are doing so, they are pressing the Indian authorities on that, and the onus has been on myself and others along with Jack Tar's family to make sure the pressures that the UK government fulfills that obligation. The difficulty is that it is the government of the Republic of India who will not allow that to happen. Uh, and that's where the point we had got to with the UN Rapporteur on torture, uh, who is looking at the investigation because of course the Indian Republic is a signatory to the Human Rights Convention uh, at the UN. They need to meet their obligations. And those are the most serious elements in terms of torture that we continue to press both our own government and in that sense the government of the Republic of India. And you have continued to press the UK government on this issue following, you know, so-called the lack of action on the matter. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe that UK ministers and the government as a whole has taken somewhat of a reluctant approach on this matter? I think there's a, a, a litany of inconsistency in their approach from day one. When I raised the issue on the floor of the House of Commons, as I've mentioned before, the then uh, Minister Rory Stewart, who was a minister in the Foreign Office, said that they would take extreme action. Uh, when they said that, I'm sure you would appreciate there were groans of why did he say that from the Foreign Commonwealth Office staff in the gallery of the House of Commons. It was a very unusual comment to make um, and the, subsequently they left office, they were moved to partner. And now the Foreign and Commonwealth Office are having to deal with the fact that the Minister of State saved that. And what we've seen there is therefore the litany of inconsistency about how they approach Jack Tarr's case. And there are two, you know, one is special big issue that dominates UK politics, and that is Brexit. And, you know, I've been consistent in that if, you know, the issue of Brexit is not only about the UK leaving the European Union, it is our, the UK's global reputation and also its requirement to create trade deals with a large economic and growing economic powers. And of course, India will probably overtake China within the next 50 years. So, and you'll forgive the knock of the bells, that's just the House of Commons reminding us that they're there. And so that means that the UK is in some ways, um, and I, you know, the evidence is anecdotal, but Brexit is really the UK government being yeah. told, well, we want to have a trade deal with India. That's going to be difficult because the UK is the one that's holding back the present EU trade deal with India. And once Britain leaves the EU, the EU will have a very quick trade deal yeah. with India. So how the UK government overcomes that, I don't know. Uh, and then there's the, um, the kind of issue of the upcoming election in India. And where the BJP and also the Congress party show themselves to be as, you know, the, the, the government of authority or the government of authority in waiting. Yeah. And I think Jack Tarr, his case plays into that and they're utilising that for their own political means. Yeah. And that does no one any good. It doesn't do the rule of law any good. It doesn't do the democratic credentials of the uh, Congress party or the BJP any good as well. Do you think there's a chance that we may actually be in the same situation as we currently are with the Jack Dar Singh Johar case in 12 months' time? He's still being detained in India and concerns continuing to mount from the community and obviously his family. Well, well, I'm just saying the bell ringing means there's a division, but because I'm a, a, a Scottish MP and it's English votes only, so I won't be participating <laughs> in leaving news uh, this morning time. The, the issue I think we have to be concerned is the, 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 the history of detention yes. 
And if you're a UK national, you'll need to now take a look at the Chennai Six, uh, where another Scot was involved in that, and they were held for up to four years. So, uh, but this goes back into the inconsistencies um, because you had already different approaches with different types of guns. If you look at the UAE, the UAE um, um, uh, stands for a young man, a UK national, who the UAE said was an MI5 operative. You know, he was out within a couple of months, which was great, but it shows a difference in inconsistency in consular support yeah. and also in how families um, are, are advised by the Foreign Commonwealth Office. So what Jack Tar's case does, it raises up the complication of um, open and transparent process within the Indian judicial system, and it also throws up the issue of inconsistency in our own consular mm. support services. And just a final point on this matter, knowing the UK stance on the situation, do you fear that residents up and down the UK may actually think twice before travelling overseas now and you know even in India? I, I think if you know you were travelling to uh, Punjab, mm. uh, I could you know I can really understand especially if you were from a Sikh background I can understand why you might not want to go uh, I fully appreciate that uh, there are a whole range of issues in terms of safety about traveling to India India has one of the worst records in, tr in treatment of women mm -hmm. therefore there are huge concerns around that that no one really wants to talk about also not just because you're a Sikh but Christians in India um, also get a difficult time of it and in some areas of India so do those Indians who happen to be Muslim. So you know it, there, there are a whole range of issues uh, that impact that but in terms of Jagtar and the Sikh community I can fully understand why they may say to themselves I'm not travelling to India. And also the other issues of UK nationals of any you know, religious or ethnic background um, travelling to another part of the world in which there is inconsistency mm. in consular support from either embassies, high commissions or uh, consuls anywhere else that, you know, if they're a UK national, any other part of the world. Yeah. And moving on to a matter I don't think anyone in the UK can get away from, the issue of Brexit of mm. course. With Theresa May seemingly not wanting to budge on her deal, yeah. how concerned are you at the prospect of a no deal scenario? Well, you know, in Scotland we had a very lengthy debate before the Scottish independence mm. referendum in 2014 where we discussed for over two years Scotland's place in the world. And we were told by the UK government that we could only remain within the EU if we were part of the United Kingdom. And that two year debate and discussion, I think, really informed how we eventually voted also the 2016 EU referendum. And that's why the majority of Scots um, voted overwhelmingly to remain within the EU because we had debated at length who we were in terms of the rest of the world and that was about being a member of the European Union. You know, we are the, Scotland is the oldest unified nation in Europe from 843 AD mm. and we are distinctly aware of um, our role in trying to make a more progressive yeah. and socially cohesive Europe. Whereas in the rest of the UK, whether it be England, Wales or Northern Ireland, that we had a short campaign in terms of the EU referendum and it was utilised and controlled by reactionary, right-wing, racist, bigoted terminology. And I think, you know, that the utter failure of the British political class, now it's not only the Conservative Party, but the Labour Party, to give a progressive rationale why the rest of the UK should remain within the EU has fundamentally undermined Britain's um, global footprint and how it's seen in the rest of the world and that has ramifications for a whole range of issues including for Jack Tarski. Mm. And in some ways if you look at Parliament it's a bit of a reflection as the UK as a whole completely divided on Brexit. Mm. Do you think that we can as a nation fully unite communities once again and get past this division in the long term? It depends on what nation you're talking about. In the UK as a so, whole? Well, the United Kingdom is a political state. It is a found in the Treaty of Union in 1707. There are two nations, three nations, Scotland, England and Wales and the province of Northern Ireland. Therefore the nation of Scotland has a clear position through the claim of right that it can exercise uh, when it wishes and when it seems fit its determination on its own governance and destiny. And how the UK Prime Minister 
um, will kind of deal with that mm. in relationship to England and also surprisingly Wales Brexiteer credentials um, and also the difficulties of Northern Ireland with the British border on the Isle of Ireland with the rest of the European Union that's a circle that I do believe that the Prime Minister will be unable to square. Okay. Do you think Theresa May there was a, have somewhat of an impossible task to please everyone in Parliament on the issue of Brexit? The Prime Minister only needs to please the Tory party and the DUP and that's where I think a lot of people forget in terms of Brexit mm. what the Prime Minister's main concern is is ensuring the unity and purpose of the Conservative and Unionist Party, because that's its title, and also <coughs> making sure that the DUP uh, keep her in Downing Street. And do you feel a lot of concerns obviously raised around Brexit, but do you think the state of British politics as a whole at the minute has led the public to sort of lose faith in politicians? Do you know, uh, again, we're using this terminology about Britain, um, the UK, uh, if you were to go to Scotland, you would see a very different political yeah. dynamic and you would see far more, I think, uh, intellectually based mm. discussion at a whole range of levels of different elements of society about our role in the world. And, uh, and that's in, from different, from different political points of view. I think in the rest of the UK, there is uh, control of the press and media by a very right wing reactionary uh, approach about the UK's place in the world and it's also harks back to a time when the UK you know was a colonial power mm. and I'm sorry you know those days are gone you know that this is looking at the world through rose-coloured spectacles is delusional mm. uh, and the you know the only thing that will come out of this is there is no such thing as a good Brexit every analysis even the government's own analysis highlight that the UK will find an economic detriment by leaving the European Union. Yeah. Uh, therefore there will be dramatic consequences for every nation within the e within the United Kingdom. There's a Scottish constituency MP and one who represents a constituency that not only voted to remain within the European yeah. Union, but a constituency which voted overwhelmingly for Scotland to be an independent sovereign mm. nation. There's only one answer for us, and that's for us to remain within the European mm. Union at the top table as an independent country once again. But saying that, do you acknowledge the concerns that Leave voters have, Leave voters who are calling for the result of the 2016 referendum to be respected? Do you know we have a tradition in Scotland that's about, it's about being able to change your mind, mm. <laughs> you know, and not to have fear to have made a mistake, because only by making mistakes do you grow and learn. And you know, in Scotland we have a constitutional tradition of the sovereignty of the people. Now. The people in Scotland have now twice elected majority SNP MPs mm. from Scottish constituencies. They voted to remain within the European Union and we have seen a constitutional material change to constitutional position by this extraction from the EU. And, you know, in respecting the voters in England and Wales, I fully get that. Mm. Great, no worries. I think it's an absolute insanity based on a premise of lies written on the back of a bus that will not be fulfilled and placing their own children and grandchildren at an economic and social detriment. Scotland has a different alternative and whilst I would fully support a second people's vote, mm. um, I would certainly and always will believe that Scotland has the ability and the right, through our claim of right, um, to determine our own governance and destiny, whether that's to remain within the United Kingdom or as I would hope one day to be an independent sovereign nation state at the top table in Brussels. Mm. And many politicians, including the Labour leadership, calling for a general election. Do you think that's really what people want to see, a general election in the current state of politics? Bring on, you know, great. I mean, we, you know, we've been telling the leader of the, the official British opposition party, and again, we are actually the third largest yeah. party yeah. in the House of Commons. We're actually, by membership, the, the second largest party in the UK. But we've been saying to them, you know, get on with the vote and no conscience. The difficulty is, he eventually got on with it and lost it. Mm. So, to, to me, will there be a general election? I don't think so. Um, if there is, I think the utter inconsistency in the approach by the leader of the British Labour Party will not bear fruit for him. Yeah. And I think you will find on the doorsteps that their lack of consistency on Brexit 
and their pro-Brexit stance, especially in Scotland, is going down like a leaded balloon. We are a European nation, Scotland. We see ourselves as an integral part mm. of the story and the history of Europe, for all its good points and all its bad points. And that utter lack of knowledge about Scotland's political history, its, its own political history, mm. it is shown in some of the kind of stats we're getting back in the doors in terms of the, how the Labour leadership approaches it. Uh, and the fact is that they are now the third party in Scotland, um, I, I think, just sums up um, their lack of understanding mm. about the different dynamic um, in Scotland today. And as to the rest of the UK, you know, I, I, I am appalled that they're, getting, you know, they're going to leave the European Union. I would wish they would stay, but Scotland has an out uh, where we can maybe have a more progressive foreign policy and engagement methods with people like the government of the Republic of India. And as you mentioned, the SNP is the third highest number of MPs in Parliament. But does it ever get frustrating for you having a smaller presence than Labour and the Conservatives and potentially not getting through matters that you want to? Well, you know, uh, we're not going to be standing MPs in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that would happen. Um, and, you know, we are representing our constituents to the best of our ability. And we are already in government in Edinburgh. And we have since for, near, for over 11 years now. The First Minister of Scotland is actually in London today across the road in Downing Street meeting the Prime Minister, acting in good faith, whereas the leader of the official opposition can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we agree with the Prime Minister in that sense is irrelevant. The Prime Minister has made it quite clear that they have their own red line, such as no second vote, um, <clears throat> that we, the UK, will leave uh, the European Union on the 29th of March. So whilst we're acting in good faith, there is also the element the Prime Minister is not, and more importantly, this has been seen in Scotland. It's been seen by the nation yeah. that the UK government to us is acting uh, in bad faith. And prior to becoming an MP, I think I'm correct in saying in 92 you were elected as Scotland's youngest councillor at the age of 21. Yeah. What was it that made you want to get into politics? Um, growing up where I come from at that time, uh, it seems like life, <laughs> uh, everything, everyone was very political. Uh, it's a very big part of Scottish discourse. Uh, my father is um, a coppersmith trade who works in the shipyards. Yeah. He was a trade unionist, um, uh, very vocal in the shipyard strikes in the 1970s in my hometown of Clyde Bank. So for me, the natural step was to join a political party. And while my family were traditionally Labour, like so many mm. of us, I thought it was really inconsistent to believe in, uh, for example, coming from a large Irish background, to vocalise the liberty um, and the requirement for a free Ireland where mm. our grandparents came from, but not to believe that your own nation couldn't be free as well. And that's why I didn't join uh, the Labour Party. I thought it was utterly uh, inconsistent. And I joined a political party that I thought was relevant to me and more importantly, it was anti-nuclear, mm -hmm. and it believed in the nation. And those were the two major facts. A belief in self-worth in yourself and your background, um, not based on the colour of your skin, the god you, or the gods you worship, but because we know, um, we, we have a, a saying in modern Scottish politics, which was first said by Bashir, the late Bashir Ahmed, mm -hmm. who was the first ever um, Asian member of the Scottish Parliament. And he said, to be Scottish, it's not about where you're from, it's about where we're going as a nation. And that really ties into the, the notion of what we are uh, uh, and how we want, want to create a progressive Scotland. And, and, and that really goes back to why I joined the SNP and why I decided to get involved in local government at the coalface. Um, and it was a steep learning curve. Yeah. Do you still think there needs to be more diversity in politics? And if so, how do you believe that we as a society can sort of bring that to fruition? Yeah, I mean, there's always got to be diversity. You can't... To, to be in, in modern um, liberal democratic society, you have to reflect the people around you. Now, yeah. First of all, in Scotland, that means you don't have MPs who are all multi-millionaires. Um, you don't have MPs who are all, you know, lawyers. And there are a lot, even in my own yeah. political group. Um, you have to have MPs who represent the broad swathe of how people identify. Um, and you know, you know in, in Scotland, for instance, we have a cabinet secretary who's a, a, a Muslim MSP. He's also from, he's an Asian background. Uh, his family originally from Pakistan. Uh, you know, we have open LGBT members. Uh, myself, I yeah. come from the largest 
uh, group uh, of uh, parliamentary group for LGBT members yeah. uh, in the Westminster Parliament, and also critically around the representation of more women mm. and other you know, elements of society. You know, uh, and the only way to do that is to talk about the benefits of diversity. We could put in as much legislation as we like, but if we're not talking to one another about the n why diversity is positive, yeah. then we're not going to win that argument. You've got to talk. You've got to have the argument first before you can win it. Changing the law on diversity is one element to it, a very important element, of course. But if you don't talk about the value and worth of diversity, then we all lose. Mm -hmm. And in this continent, we all know what happens when we silence diversity and liberty. And National Socialism taught us that between you know the early 30s and 1945, where you know the annihilation of the European Europeans who happened to be Jewish, the um, utilizing people who had disabilities, learning and physical for. Um, experimentation, the utter destruction of the Gypsy Roma community, and the insidious racism of imperialism within Europe. So our diversity is our great strength. And that's not just for me in Scotland, but for everyone whether it's in the rest of the UK or yeah. anywhere in the world. If you are n creating a narrow field of, of an expression of humanity, then you're doing yourself a, a grave disservice. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there have been many challenges for you since becoming MP, but excluding the word Brexit, are there any particular days in mind that stick in your mind as being particularly tough and difficult? Uh, yeah, uh, Syria. Okay. Um, and you know, I, you know, people say, oh, I tried to talk in the Syria debate and was bobbing up and down as we do here mm. for 10 hours. That vote was particularly difficult because you're making a choice in which members of the armed forces are going to probably kill people. Yeah. And, you know, the complexity of the Syrian situation in terms of the different approaches, in terms of the different groups on the ground. And, you know, we have been consistent about UN-led missions, about the mandate of the United Nations. We're now seeing the fundamental undermining of the international rule of law. The UN Security Council, you know, the veto is now the biggest thing that everyone uses. It just used to be the Russian Federation. Chinese are using it, carte blanche, even we are, you know, well, we are, we haven't maybe used it from the 70s, but it means that we're not going through the UN anymore. So voting against uh, that action was tough. Mm. You know, I, I have a family that are in the, the forces. My nephew's just passed out from what they call the Royal Marines. Uh, my brother served in Iraq and in Afghanistan twice. My father was a Royal Engineer. And I understand why people say, you know, well, there's a need for military mm. action. There is a need for military action when you have a plan to what happens after that. Yeah. And the other in utter inconsistency of that show has shown because literally, whilst we may have made progress against Daesh, we are literally allowing the Assad regime to remain. Yeah. Fundamentally, with the backing of the Russian Federation and with the withdrawal of the now smaller US forces from Kurdistan and from the per Peshmerga, um, you know, we are seeing a fundamental Russia and Syria, the, the, the present regime, mm. has won that war. Uh, and that again is always a kind of throwback to you know, creating that hotbed of fundamentalism during the uh, Iraq and Iraq, in the Iraq conflict. Mm. So that was a very difficult night on a, 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 in terms of making a decision about sending people, well, technically not to war, mm. but allowing them to drop bombs in the name of the political state in which you're a parliamentarian. And just to finish, looking ahead on the political spectrum, mm. what are your long-term ambitions? Where would you like to be in, say, 10, 15 years' time? At home, in an independent <laughs> sovereign <from> Scotland. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And are you confident that will come to fruition? No, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think... You know, Scotland has made uh, itself clear uh, based on a premise in 2014. Uh, the independence vote uh, was down around about 24% when we started that campaign. We got up to, you know, the high 40s. My own constituency, we got over the line, we voted for independence. And I think the country is now seeing in a broad swathe that remaining, the benefits of remaining within the United Kingdom as a political union of unequals. Yeah is far, no, uh, you know, the, the European Union offers equality at the top table 
and we can bring things to the top table, economically, politically, socially. And we need to make that argument because by doing so and remaining within the European Union, we create, we, we create a more socially progressive Europe. The world needs Scotland to be independent. The world needs Scotland to vocalise a different view of what social democracy, democracy means for the mm. world. And that's about engagement, lifting ourselves out of poverty, having self-worth and value on each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, and, I, and, and yeah, it will happen. There is no doubt in my mind now that it, it is coming and it's coming fast. Martin, thank you for sharing your views with the SEEK channel today. Delighted. Uh, and just to you know, Friday is coming. It's Burns Night, the great bard of Scotland. And to all of your viewers, have a great Burns supper and enjoy it. Uh, read a wee bit of poetry, learn a wee bit about Scotland, learn about where Jagtar Singh Johal comes from. Comes from the ancient borough of Dumbarton. He is a son of we say of the Rock. And you know, as I said, you know, to be a Scot is not about where we're from, but where we're going. And for us, that's also in terms of Jagtar making sure he comes home to take his place back in his own community. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for watching today. Make sure to tune in next week for The Politics Show. Vaigrujika Khalsa, Vaigrujiki Fateh.